Okay, cool. So yeah, my name is Morello. Um, oh, this is. There we go. You guys can see the pointer. Okay, cool, cool. So yeah, the talk's gonna be effective data science teams with data books. So this is me, Morello. So what are we gonna talk about today exactly? Boom. So this is the agenda. We're gonna start with an intro. You are here in case I already lost you. Hopefully not. Uh, we're gonna talk about data science in the wild, right? So what I see about data science and whatnot. We're gonna focus on Jupyter Notebooks, what it is, what are their roles in data, in data science. We're gonna talk about some issues with notebooks, uh, some existing solutions. Uh, we're gonna talk about data books. Woohoo! Yeah, that's me right there. Um, then we're gonna do a demo, what it is, what it does, how it works, et cetera, et cetera. And also, I noticed now as well that the, the counting started again, so uh, yeah, it's a typo. <laughs> okay, cool. So, first things first, some words about me. Uh, I recently joined Twitter. I was at another PyCon and people were like, ah, the world is on Twitter. You're not on Twitter? I was like, I feel a, li a little bit left out. So I was like, okay, I just, I just quickly went in there. LinkedIn, feel free to add me. This is my personal, uh, my professional email. I am from Brazil, so uh, is anyone from Brazil here? Yeah, I think I heard some Portuguese whispers on the crowd, so yeah, okay. Um, so you guys probably knew that I'm from Brazil. Murilo Cunha is a very Brazilian name. Um, but yeah, people outside Brazil don't know that. But anyways, uh, I live in Belgium actually, so I'm not, I don't live in Brazil anymore. Uh, I've been out, out of Brazil for quite some time. I did my bachelor's in mechanical engineering, as it was introduced <laughs> at uh, K11, so that's in the, no, sorry, not K11, PNW, so that's in the US, and then I did my master's in artificial intelligence. I also have some certifications, right, so for Google Cloud, I have a data and machine learning engineer certification, AWS for machine learning, HashiCorp, Terraform, that's infrastructure as code, yada, 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 DAG, Airflow, Snowflake, blah, 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 blah. Anyways, um, I'm also a coach and a tech lead for the AI business unit at Data Roots. So we are a consultancy company that we try to help the customers to achieve their data solutions, let's say. So that's AI, data engineering, et cetera, et cetera. So and I'm a machine learning engineer at Data Roots. Cool, still, everyone's still with me? Everyone's still excited? There's still time to leave, no? Okay, cool, all right. So uh, what is machine learning engineer in my eyes, right? Like what's my role in that whole story? Uh, my role, the way I see it, is to put machine learning models or ideas into production, right? To make that sure that that's useful, right? So uh, in doing so, I see some friction. There are some patterns that we see. Maybe before we start, uh, anyone here in data science? Okay. Uh, do you, anyone that uses notebooks frequently? Okay. Who loves notebooks? Okay, yeah. Who hates notebooks? Oh, okay, okay, yeah, okay, let's see, maybe. I don't know if I'll ask at the end of the conversation here, but um, hopefully I can convince you. Um, but anyways, so yeah, I see a lot of, uh, I see some recurring patterns when I'm trying to put these ideas into production, right? One of them is the friction between data scientists and data engineers, right? So I think they have different profiles and they have different requirements and they don't always see eye to eye, right? Like they have the famous, Throw over, the wall, throw over the wall approach, right? The, the data scientists, they come up with these models and they're like, okay, yeah, there you go, sir, now you put it in production. And then the, the, the data engineers are like, ah, shit, whatever. Um, so that's one thing that I see, but more interestingly, sometimes I see some friction in between data scientists. And the reason why I see that in my eyes is because of data science tooling. And that's because data scientists love notebooks, right? Like. They love everything about it, right? Like you, a lot of the times when you say data science, you're already thinking of notebooks. We're gonna see a bit more of, uh, of that coupling, right? Um, so in case you're not familiar with notebooks, anyone here not familiar with notebooks? Don't be shy. Okay. <laughs> um, but basically the interactive uh, environment, right? So you can run some little bits of code and you can see the outputs for each bit. You runs it in your browser. That's the Jupyter Lab, even though VS Code has also their extensions and whatnot. Um, they are stateful, so if you declare a variable, you can also check it later. The format is this i, pi, and b, right? And if you look into it, it's just JSON. So we're gonna go a bit deeper into that because that causes some issues in my eyes. Uh, you have different kernels, right? Uh, we're gonna talk mainly about Python here, and that's what you can think for the rest of this talk. But you, you can also have some R kernels or some Spark, so that's Scala, right, or PySpark, et cetera, et cetera, if you have distributed computing like clusters and whatnot. There we go. Um, so, in case you've never seen a notebook before, 
this is how they look like, right? So you have some code, you can write, uh, you can execute it, you have some uh, markdown, right? So if you want to add some notes, et cetera, et cetera, if you have some plots, you can see them here. And I think this is why they're very good for data science, right? A lot of times you get some data, you don't know what's there, you want to create some plots quickly, you know, you just want to share with your friends and everything. Um, and this is, uh, yeah, this is the image from data quest. But that's kind of what it is, right? So nothing too crazy here. Where do we see a lot of notebooks? Well, we see a lot of them in Kaggle competitions, right? So data science competitions, we see them. Some people love notebooks so much that they write books with Jupyter notebooks. Yes, that's true. Yeah, yeah, O'Reilly books, yeah. Um, some people, do you know FastAI? Anyone familiar with FastAI? Yeah, okay, one hand there. So it's like there's some, yeah, two hands, okay, cool. We have some courses, right, that people use notebooks, right, to kind of go step by step to show what each part is doing. Um, these are the three big, uh, the big three cloud providers, right? So Vertex AI, Azure, uh, well, Azure ML, this is for Google, this is for Azure, and this is for AWS, the SageMaker. They all have their own notebook environment. And actually, even SageMaker, a lot of the stuff, a lot of the other services you can access via the notebook environment, right? So Google Colab, everyone familiar with Google Colab? Yeah? Anyone who doesn't know what it is? So I think it's really a really cool uh, environment for people that are starting to learn, right? You can just go in the drive, create a Colab, and start, you know? And um, Paper Mill, does anyone know Paper Mill? You know Paper Mill? Yeah, yeah. Um, so Paper Mill, as I understand, I never used it, but it's a way to put notebooks in production, right? I'm not going to go into merit if that's a good idea or not, okay? But it exists, and I heard that there are a lot of companies, big companies, that have success with that, right? So it is an option here. Cool. So as good if, as as good as things look, there are some notebook haters, right? Even some here in the audience. I see you. Huh? Uh, anyways, do you guys know who just Joel Gruz is? No, anyone? No one knows? He's like an a, a AI researcher, I think, for Allen Institute. And he's a very, a man of strong opinions, very bold man. He actually went to a JupyterCon, so that's a conference for Jupiters. And then he wrote, a, he did a talk on, I don't like notebooks. So he actually goes through a lot of the reasons why he doesn't like notebooks. And actually, it's a very good talk, right? I still like notebooks, right? Um, but he has some very valid points here, okay? So I would also advise people to watch it. This guy here on the right, uh, he's Nicholas Gelders. Does anyone know who that is? No? No one? Yeah, okay. So the, he actually works with me, so I'll be very surprised if anyone, like, oh, I know this guy. But anyways, okay, so uh, let's get familiar with Nico Gelders, right? Who is this guy? So he's a data engineer, first of all. He is, uh, well, he's Belgium, right? So he's a good Belgium. He loves long bike rides. Um, he also loves VS Code. Actually, funny story, I was in PyCon Japan doing this talk, and I met Anthony Shaw. I don't know if anyone knows Anthony Shaw, but he's a Python advocate for Microsoft. And he loves VS Code more than Anthony Shaw, I feel. He advocates more for it than Anthony Shaw. But anyways, so he's a man of very strong opinions. And one of his strong opinions is that he hates notebooks. So I made it my mission to convince Nicholas Gelders that notebooks are not that bad after all, right? But I have to admit that I also have some issues with notebooks. And my main issues are when it comes to the tooling, right? So Jupyter notebooks don't cope very well with Git, right? There's a lot of extra stuff. There's whenever you have conflicts, you're like, so I had this beef, right? The, my first thought was I cannot be the first person to experience this, right? So I did some research and there are some solutions. So first solution, just don't use notebooks. That's, that's what I heard uh, a lot, right? Like Nicholas Gelder, uh, he's one of these guys. Huh? It's like, okay, just, just stay away from it. Like they're not good, right? Why? Okay. Uh, I think we can do better. Uh, then there's Jupytex. Anyone knows Jupytex? No? So Jupytex actually syncs notebooks with Python scripts, and then the idea is that you commit the Python scripts, right? So it works well for a lot of people, but I still feel like the outputs are actually valuable, right, to debug and do a lot of stuff. So I think we can still do better. Uh, this is Review NB. Anyone knows Review NB? No? It's a GitHub actually application that you can use whenever you have pull requests and everything, so you can compare the two versions of the notebook very easily. Um, NB Clean, anyone? No? NB Clean is a CLI tool that you can remove metadata from notebooks. Okay? Uh, we have NB Dev, so that's a big one. Anyone? It's from FastAI as well? Yeah? Do you like NB Dev? Maybe? Uh... We're evaluating it. Okay. So I really like the ideas from it, but uh, maybe for everyone else. Huh? <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to start just a conversation here. Um, NB Dev is like people from FastAI, they love notebooks so much that they wanted to make it a solution for building packages. So the idea is that you have notebooks. From the notebooks, you create scripts. 
In the notebooks, you can actually create HTML pages. So you actually, that's also the documentation. So you have everything from, from notebooks, right? And they also have some very interesting ideas. Personally, I felt like it does a lot. It does maybe too much. Uh, and it becomes too opinionated. So it didn't really fit the needs that I had, right? But it's there. NB Dime, that's also a big one. Do, anyone familiar with NB Dime? No? Yeah? Okay. So NB Dime is like, so if you have to diff uh, notebooks or you have to merge them, you can use this tool beforehand. So like you know that you're gonna merge notebooks, so use this tool, which is really nice. Uh, does some of the stuff that I wanted to do, but maybe not everything. And the newest addition to this family is, bah, notebooks, data books, right? So yeah, there we go. Um, so uh, yeah, maybe spoiler alert, right? Like I created this, so I kind of love it. Uh, but anyways. Um, and I'm gonna talk more about this, of course, but uh, there is an overlap with all these tools. Uh, but we're gonna dive in deeper, and if you guys have more questions on how this compares, I can talk about it later. Maybe just another uh, point to MB Dev, right? Uh, this, I tried MB Dev 1. I didn't have a really great experience, and I don't think I was the only one because they released MB Dev 2, right? So <laughs> it was super great, like, uh, okay. Um, and this is actually fairly recent, right? So from August, uh, end of August of 2022. Jeremy Howard, big name. Um, and actually there's again, a big overlap. Even the way the internals, how it works, there's a big overlap, but still the, it's fundamentally different, I would say. Databooks is not trying to create packages with notebooks, okay? So without further ado, what is Databooks? So it's a CLI tool. I feel like it's the easiest way to, you know, touch a lot of environments and to make it less, uh, well, easy to use, let's say. Uh, it's about sharing, caring about notebooks. So if you share and care about notebooks, then you shouldn't use this tool. Um, it's an API for handling notebooks, right? So we actually mimic the Jupyter protocol, like how this, the JSON structure works. And we're gonna go a bit more later on how this is set up. It is configurable, so you can have a PyProject Automo and you can specify your things. You can say, well, we're gonna go see a bit more in this in detail. So it's not too opinionated, or I try not to make it too opinionated. It has five commands, so it's a CLI tool, it has sub commands, right? You can remove metadata, you can fix git conflicts, you can assert metadata, you can show a rich representation of notebooks and a rich representation of diffs, okay? It has pre-commit hooks available. Anyone familiar with pre-commit hooks? Yeah? So this is, a, well, pre-commit hooks is something more abstract, right? It's just like something that runs right before you commit something. This is a package that makes it super easy to actually add pre-commit hooks to your uh, repo, I guess. So it's the pre-commit package. And if you look into their data books, you're gonna see these two comments here. So it is set up there, you can use it. So again, everything, all of this was built in mind of trying to make Nico happy. Oh yeah. We have here Jupyter running, right? I'm gonna have this demo notebook. That's what we're gonna play with. So let's see what's in here. We have this demo, we have a notebook directory, you have the PyProject.toml. So first things first is, um, let's look into a notebook. So if you dump that, uh, demo, blah, blah, blah. So again, it's just JSON, right? It has this hipster IPINB extension, but it's just JSON. So you have this cell property here and you have a list of cells. Each cell has a type, has an ID, has some metadata, et cetera, et cetera, right? You have the source. For code cells, you also have a, an output. And so every cell has some metadata, but also the notebook has metadata, right? So we're getting there, here, right? So we have this metadata, so you have the kernel specification, display name, et cetera, et cetera. So that means that, so this is the same display name, by the way, right? So that means if I share this notebook with anyone and you have a different kernel name, there will already be difference in the, in the JSON, right? But do you care? Maybe not, maybe yes, I don't know, probably not. Okay, so first thing we can do is, you can install data books. So it's a CLI tool, it's already installed, right? You have these commands here. So let's start with data books, meta, right? So meta is a command to remove this metadata, right? This metadata is in the way, it can be helpful, but a lot of times it causes a lot of conflict. So let's be proactive and try to remove it before any issues come, come up. So for the notebooks, meta and demo. I'm gonna override this notebook, so I'm asking for uh, confirmation, right? But then what it will do, ah, maybe I should also show this before. Huh? So you see here, this is the notebook we're gonna be playing with. You have execution, you have a, a metadata. So this is a cell tag, right? So data, uh, data books meta will remove some of this metadata, right? So if I just do this here, let's do again. First, you see that I've rearranged the, the keys. So the notebook metadata is actually on the top now, so not important. But the notebook metadata is already removed. Ooh. Excuse me. Uh, you see here that the cells uh, now don't have metadata. Execution count is not uh, is null for the code cells. 
The output is still here though. So now, if I refresh this, what you should see is that the code, the execution count goes away and the cell tags, right? So drum roll. Wow. Cool, okay. So this worked. Um, well, let's say that you don't actually want the outputs. So again, there is an argument whether you should keep them or not, but we try not to make it too opinionated so you can configure it so you can actually run Latin books meta, remove outs. Okay, let's confirm it again. And now, if this works well, the output's not there anymore, right? So that's the first step, right? So let's try to remove the stuff that can cause us issues. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna do git restore memo. Refresh this again. So sometimes you can try to be proactive and remove the notebook metadata, but sometimes there's still conflicts, right? Like the same way that sometimes Git conflicts are unavoidable. So let's try to do something. Let's try to uh, merge this suspicious branch here. Oh, conflict, should have known, right? Um, if I do git status, you see that this is the issue. If I do, uh, if I try to actually see how the notebook looks like, it's just a git diff, right? But why is this an issue? Because now you cannot actually open the notebook anymore, right? If I try to refresh this naively here, we'll just say this is not JSON, right? So I cannot open this. Okay, um, some of the stuff is like, this is metadata issues, right? Um, you also have this ID again, that can cause issues, right? You probably don't care about this. Uh, but there's sometimes there are more meaningful things that you cannot avoid with removing the metadata, right? So the clear example here is this, right? So there's something that happened and the output is different, right? So this is where data books fix comes in, right? So once you have a conflict, you can actually run data books fix and then the path and it'll clean it for you, right? So now, so this is the other notebook, by the way, right? If I open this here now, you see this git-like diff here, right? Again, you probably are probably thinking, ah, oh, this is also the change, right? Maybe you're thinking, why is this so big? Why is this diff so big? This is probably a bug. I would say think again, because we're also taking the whole cell as an object, right? So here we actually have a cell tag and here we don't. So that's why there's a diff. So again, if the cell tags are there, I'm under the assumption that you care about them. So I'm not gonna remove it for you without you knowing. Right? Also, the output here is different, right? So again, this could be an indication that you need to set a seed, a random seed in data science. You want to make stuff reproducible, right? So that's another thing. Cool. So now you can go here and fix them here instead of trying to do some magic with the JSONs. Cool, everyone with me still? Yeah? Okay. All right, let's see what else. Um, pum, pum. Ah, yeah. So sometimes, and right now we looked into how to remove metadata, but also how to fix once the issues are there. But sometimes what if you want to, you want the metadata. So maybe the paper mill people, can you confirm that you could use the cell text to specify inputs? Is that right? No? No one knows? Okay. So I think for like, if you, you're in paper mill, there's actually like, you can make use of the cell tags. So you actually want cell tags sometimes, or maybe if you're writing a book or whatever, if you're creating slides or, well, I don't know, it's, the possibilities are endless, right? But the idea is that you can actually assert, like maybe I want the, the, the meta, the, sorry, the cell tags to be there. Maybe I want the notebook to have only certain cells. And this is where data books assert comes in. The way that it works is that I can pass an expression, right? And this is like Python code reading. Let's say 10, and then it's going to pass a path, right? And then here it says, well, this actually is okay, right? So it's basically asserting that this is actually working the way you're thinking. Uh, maybe just to make this fail, right? I can say, let's say less than one. And then you see here that it fails because you, and also it actually starts as one, right? So that's why you have the red arrow here. Uh, more in, so this is like high level what it works, what it does, uh, but then you can start doing more interesting things with it. I also came up with this concept of like recipes. So it's like kind of things that you can do that may be useful. And one of the, my favorites, let's say, is this uh, seek, exec, uh, seek exec here. Uh, also, if you go into documentation, you can see exactly what it's doing. But basically the idea with this one is to make sure that the execution order is increasing, right? So another issue with notebooks is that I can come up here, do this, save it, and good to go, right? I commit, and then whenever someone tries to run this, it's not gonna work, right? This is a simple example, of course, but this is a real issue, right? So if I do git status, it's the diff, and if I do data books, assert, pass a recipe, oh, and then seek, exec, and then again the path, 
this will fail, right? And then this is also how, <clears throat> the first time I showed this, people were like, well, my boss actually, he was like, when will someone run this? Would you like to run this all the time? But this is when the pre-commit hooks come in handy, right? So for example, I have, so maybe just to show, this is the pyproject.toml, so the same way you configure black or anything like that, right? Oh, sorry. This is the configuration. The pre-commit hooks are here, right? So again, you just pass the ID, you pass the repo, and then here is like data books assert, and I'm passing this recipe to sec exec, right? So if I do git add, and then I try to do git should fail, it would try and it would say, no, I cannot, I, cannot, I cannot commit this. This is not in order, right? So now if I go back here and I put this area how it was before, geez. and maybe let's make a change, right? So it's, there's an actual diff. Should pass. And then it works. Right? So again, it's like trying to set up some guardrails so people don't do crazy things and then make these, all this uh, unreproducible. Uh, there's something else, I think. Let me check my notes. Ah, yeah, okay. So sometimes, and this is maybe me, right? I feel like I'm a CLI user as well. But sometimes you see this diff here and it's like, okay, now I need to turn up Jupyter just to see this, just to see that, right? So I didn't like this so much. So I actually set, came up with this data book show if I just want to take a quick peek at a notebook. And then you can actually see a nice rendering of the notebook on your terminal, right? So you have the markdown cells here, you have syntax highlighting, you have all the outputs, right? So this is just a quick and dirty, like let's take a look at what's in here. Um, but the more useful, actually, let me show another example. Uh, right, so also we have some nice, nice uh, table parsing here, right? Um, but actually, if I'm being honest, when I, when I put this together, I was just trying to get to something else. I actually wanted to show diffs, right? So a lot of the times you want to try to commit something, there's a diff there. Uh, there is an extension actually on Jupyter for you to see diffs, but maybe I don't want to actually open Jupyter just for this, right? Maybe I just want to do something quick and dirty on the terminal. So you, there's also the data books diff, right? This is trying to mimic the git diff, right? So you can actually compare branches, you can compare blobs, you can compare files, well, file versions, right? So let's say if I do this here, right, and I do data books. Let's see how it works, let's see if it is, yeah, there we go, see? So now I can see that the only thing that I changed here are these two cells, right? So that's kind of how it all comes together. If you have maybe data books meta and then something changed, you can actually quickly look in your terminal, how is this thing going? Uh, another thing, and that's an idea, and I'm still working on this, uh, is um, what if I want to have this diff on a pull request, right? So for example, here, I put this, uh, this little, is the internet working? Yeah, okay. So I have this little sample here, right? Uh, demo CI. Um, and I know there are ways that you can actually make comments with some images and whatnot, right? So let's say that I'm having this uh, pull request here. This is uh, maybe, uh, this was 15 hours ago. So I made this commit at 1.30 a.m. So <laughs> last minute add additions here, right? The idea is once you make a pull request, you can actually add some CI CD that would actually add a comment on what are the differences between your current version and the master, right? So if you wanna have a look, oh, what are gonna be the changes in the master version? What are the things that you're actually committing with the Jupyter notebooks? You can actually add a comment here, right? And this is with CML. So this is another open source thing, uh, GitHub Actions that works with GitLab, Bitbucket and GitHub. Um, and yeah, and I think uh, that's it. Well, I'm not super happy with this still, to be honest, uh, so it may change, but this is just an idea, right? Like once you have this in a text format, you can actually export it in a different ways and kind of like you can go crazy with it. So Pydentic is a way that you can model these JSON structures and you can serialize it to JSON and deserialize it and there's some data validation, et cetera, et cetera. It's actually pretty user friendly. So if you haven't, if you haven't, I would encourage you to give it a try. Um, but this is kind of what's happening in the background. That's how we're modeling everything. Um, the user facing stuff, we use Typer and Rich. Anyone knows Rich? No? 
Yeah, so rich is like a super cool, like, but just to kind of do these things with the terminal, right? So actually rendering the notebook uh, the way that I'm doing in the CLI is actually using rich. Uh, for the Python stuff, there's a git python extension and there's a Tom Lee, which actually is not required anymore for a Python 3.11 because it's built in, but that's how I'm actually parsing the configuration. Okay, uh, maybe some, some things on the roadmap or some things that some feedback that I already got. If you guys have any more feedback as well, I'm more than happy to hear. Um, I feel like I have a bias towards the CLI. Uh, and a lot of people told me like, well, data scientists, they love notebooks so much that they don't want to go to the terminal. So maybe you should do some extensions on Jupyter and kind of bring this closer to the Jupyter uh, lab experience. I was like, okay. Um, this, com this merging helper thing is like what I was trying to show you before, right? Whenever you're making pull requests, how you can make it easier to verify that the changes that you're making uh, are actually what you intend them, it's that, and compare notebooks from different branches and whatnot. So this is something that I'm kind of still working on. And right now, all the, uh, the CI stuff is kind of manual, right? Like I put it together, but I think it would be nice to have some GitHub actions or something like that. And these are just some that I thought before this, uh, this talk here, but there are some other ideas as well. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Um, this is the documentation as well. Feel free to go there to create an issue, to tell me I did everything wrong. Any feedback is appreciated here. Contribute, uh, yeah, everything. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, you talk a bit about uh, how uh, you work with the fixed command in data books. Can you go a bit further of how does it actually work? Uh, yeah. yeah, for sure. So uh, we don't actually parse JSON. So actually, whenever there's a conflict in the Git, you can actually see the, I think it's Git LS or something, but basically the Git conflict stores information between the two files that were before that caused the conflict. So actually, I never really parse JSON. Whenever there's a conflict, I say, okay, for this, give me the two versions before and compare them. So, and that's kind of how the diff works as well, right? So basically just comparing previous versions that created that conflict. Uh, maybe also another disclaimer, the diffing stuff is actually with Python's built-in diffLib, and that could be different from the git diff, right? So comparing diffs is sometimes subjective, right? Like, did you add something here or did you move it around? Did you replace this or did you do that? So sometimes the results are not the same as what you would get in git, but again, again, it's like sometimes the diffs in git are not helpful either, right? So, yeah. <laughs>